Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone had a safe, happy, and COVID-free Thanksgiving. And anecdotally, I get the sense that many stepped up and kept their Thanksgiving small. I also want to acknowledge uh, we had, unfortunately, three more Vermonters who lost their lives uh, to this virus. I share my condolences with their families during this difficult time. To the rest of us, please remember, this is the consequence of more virus in the community, which is exactly why we've taken the steps we've taken. There's no doubt 2020 has been a long and difficult year. Since February, we've battled a pandemic that circled the globe. As a nation, we've seen our lives change in unthinkable ways as we struggle to contain and control a virus that's already taken the lives of over a quarter million Americans and will continue to disrupt our way of life in the months to come. In Vermont, we met this challenge with the same strength and unity that has guided us through so many other challenges in our history. We've proven that listening to the science, following the data, and working together can prevent the worst impacts of this virus. That doesn't mean we've been spared from hurt or loss, because we know that's not true. But Vermonters have sacrificed to protect our families, friends, and neighbors by limiting the spread of the virus in order to keep one another as safe and as healthy as possible in these incredibly challenging times. And this should not come as a surprise because we have a history of leading the nation in important moments. From the Civil War to civil rights, our brave little state has lit the way for the nation. This time is no different. And as we find ourselves facing what we all hope will be a final surge, our example is needed now more than ever. That means paying attention to the guidance in order to slow the spread of the virus, save lives, and keep our health care system from being overwhelmed. I know how hard it is. I know how hard it will continue to be as we make our way through the holidays without the normal get-togethers and sense of closeness we all want. But with the recent news on vaccines, we now know there is light at the end of the tunnel. We will get through this, and we can see there are brighter days ahead. In that spirit, and in celebration of the coming holidays, I think it's time to lift the spirits. So I'm asking everyone to help Vermont light the way. Not only in our efforts to combat this virus, but to literally brighten our communities and neighborhoods by asking you, if able, to decorate your homes and businesses with holiday decorations and lights starting this weekend and throughout the holiday season. Let's get creative to show the world that Vermonters are here for each other, that we care about one another, and that even through these dark and difficult times, Vermont lights the way. Now, growing up in Barrie, I remember my parents would pile us three boys into the family truckster. You probably remember the wood-paneled station wagon made famous by Clark Griswold uh, and his family in the National Lampoon movies. Well, my mom and dad would load up our Buick station wagon with wood grain sides, by the way, uh, to explore the many hills of Barrie and see all the homes and businesses decorated for the holidays. It was really a great time which made for some great memories. We know the holidays will be different this year. So let's make our streets and side roads special, lit up with decorations and lights all across the state. Now, some communities are already doing this. I saw that Stowe had posted something similar on social media, and there may be others as well who are way ahead of us and I thank them for doing so. And this will only add to that as a joint effort. Of course, knowing that social media could use a whole lot more optimism and hope than we're seeing these days, 
We'll also be asking you to share photos and videos of your homes and favorite decorations on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram by using the hashtag VT Lights the Way for the rest of the world to see. And we'll be working with businesses, nonprofits, and media partners to help us spread the joy as far and as wide as possible. But we need Vermonters to pitch in, and that's really the key. Together, we can celebrate this season and remind each other that there are, in fact, brighter days ahead. And I believe it's not that far into the future. We can make a once-in-a-century pandemic holiday season a truly unique and memorable uh, one for our kids in a fun and positive way. And we can show the nation that, once again, Vermont lights the way. With that, I'll now turn it over to Secretary French for this week's education update. He's joining us by video. Secretary French. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. Uh, we completed the first phase of our surveillance testing for school staff last week. Uh, the preliminary data indicated approximately 9,389 tests were administered, and the tests identified 21 positive cases of COVID-19. The logistics behind the surveillance testing in schools are complex, involving teams from various state agencies, including the Health Department, the Agency of Education, the Agency of Transportation, and the Department of Safety. Uh, the Vermont National Guard also played a critical role. Our school districts managed the rapid deployment of the testing very well, and I want to thank them for their work in this effort. It's a good example of how our state and local partnerships have served us so well during this pandemic. Michael Clark, the superintendent for the Grand Isle Supervisory Union, sent me an email describing how things went in his district, which, as folks should know, uh, has some fairly unique geographical challenges from a logistics perspective. In his email, he wrote, As a small SU, this appeared like it was going to be a huge lift for the Grand Isle Supervisory Union, mostly because of the timing and the sense of overload we we're all feeling. However, our district nurse and I successfully ran four surveillance testing clinics in four different buildings with the support of the health assistant at each site. While there were minor glitches, everyone who participated was grateful and expressed appreciation as a sense of comfort that we were all participating. The Vermont AOE was a solid partner in helping us pull this off. Our AOE project leader was Jill Briggs Campbell, and she was fantastic at answering questions and helping us smooth the AOE, AOT, and National Guard side of logistics. AOT and National Guard also really came through. We tested 91 faculty and staff members, which is more than 50% of our faculty and staff. Overall, the project was a great success for us. Uh, at the agency, we are now uh, organizing the next phase of this testing with our partners at the Department of Health, and that testing will take place in the month of December. Uh, we'll take the lessons that we learned from the first phase to make improvements in the logistics and also the communication and support to school districts. During this next phase, we'll test 25% of our districts each week, starting next week. Uh, each testing group will include a sample of our districts from a geographic perspective, so we will have insight into the prevalence of the virus across the state on a weekly basis from the testing. The surveillance testing will be an important strategy for us to ensure the safety of our schools during the holiday operations period uh, that began with Thanksgiving and now will extend through the first of the year. We provided guidance to school districts on Monday on how to implement the recent addendum to the governor's emergency order that prohibits multi-household social gatherings associated with holidays. Our guidance allows schools to include a question in their daily health check questionnaire on multi-household social gatherings. Our guidance also allows schools to exclude students and staff who have participated in such gatherings from attending school in person until they have satisfied quarantine requirements. We believe it is important for all Vermonters to be responsible during the holiday season and follow the gathering requirements of the governor's executive order. Schools are concerned that all, not all members of their communities will do so. Our guidance is designed to provide them with another tool to help them keep our schools safe. That being said, it was reassuring uh, to see in a recent New York Times article this week that about 80% of Vermonters plan to celebrate Thanksgiving with just the members of their immediate household. This was one of the highest rates in the country on the survey, second only in Washington State. I think this underscores how willing Vermonters are to do what it takes to keep our communities and our schools safe. 
Our focus for the next several weeks through this holiday period will be to ensure the safe operations of our schools for in-person instruction. As new information about vaccines comes out, we'll begin to make plans for putting more effort on addressing the educational impact of this emergency on our students. A key aspect of that work will be to assess the impact. We learned this week that the National Assessment of Education Progress, or NAEP, will be canceled this year. NAEP, which is sometimes referred to as the nation's report card, is the one assessment that is administered in all states. We've been waiting to a certain extent for the resolution of the presidential election to pursue further discussion of state testing policy, including the administration of our Smarter Power Ballot Assessment, or SPAC. We are now starting to have those discussions in partnership with other states. There are two main themes to these discussions. On the one hand, the data from state assessments like SPAC help identify equity gaps, and we know COVID-19 has most likely exacerbated those equity gaps. On the other hand, schooling for the last eight months or so has been far from normal. So we know the results from any state level testing will represent those challenges from an accountability perspective. Also, it's unclear at this point what school will look like come spring when these assessments are typically implemented. So at this point, we'll have to see how testing policy will be addressed at the federal level. It's too early to decide how Vermont will approach testing in the spring. And to a certain extent, our decision will be influenced significantly by the federal government. At the same time, we need to start planning for how to assess the impact of this emergency on the education of our students. And I would define education broadly to include not only academics, but also their social and emotional well-being and overall healthy development. I expect that work to begin in earnest after the holiday period. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Sherman. Yeah, Commissioner Sherling, you're you're on mute either on your end or on ours. There you go. I think we've got that sorted out. Thank you. Star six on mute. <laughs> new T-shirt here in Vermont. <laughs> Uh, good morning again. Uh, I'd like to take an opportunity just to provide a couple of uh, brief updates. Uh, first, on health and safety assessments that have been occurring over the last two weeks uh, statewide. Over 1,200 have been conducted. Just a handful have resulted in, uh, in findings of uh, issues that relate to health and safety that have been followed up on with uh, businesses, primarily focusing again on lodging and, and restaurants. We expect that those uh, proactive assessments will come to an end later this week and we will remain in a reactive mode providing education based on um, tips that come in uh, both through public safety channels and via the Department of Health. Uh, on a slightly more somber note, I'd like to take a moment to highlight a situation that emerged over the last few days in the St. Albans barracks of the state police. Uh, this is an example uh, of innocent vectoring that can occur and why the health and safety posture that's been created for Vermont is so essential. Uh, this event started with uh, a significant other uh, of a trooper who was in the healthcare system getting a surveillance test, not based on any symptoms, but a, a normal surveillance test that occurs in the healthcare system. And results that were received on the 21st, just last Saturday, uh, indicating a positive COVID test. Uh, the trooper who uh, is affiliated with that person immediately went into isolation. However, going back, into what could be a, uh, a, a period of time where uh, that person was um, could, could potentially spread the virus to others. Um, we determined that there were two contact events where 15 minutes of contact with folks uh, while on duty occurred. One was the interview of a person uh, that occurred on Friday the 20th and the other was an operational briefing that occurred prior to the test result coming in on Saturday the 21st. Uh, the person who was interviewed has been contacted and in that informational or operational briefing that occurred, there were 15 additional employees who were present uh, working on uh, the execution of the search warrant 
those folks, uh, as a result of that uh, potential exposure, were also put uh, into isolation, which of course impacted the operations of the St. Albans Barracks, uh, requiring that teams from other areas of the state police backfill for coverage. Uh, we anticipate that those folks will have reached their uh, seven-day uh, period where they can test uh, later today, so they'll be uh, tested with uh, results hopefully coming back within the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, and I think I skipped uh, one of the most important things was that uh, the, the trooper who had an exposure didn't test positive, uh, that test occurring. Um, on Monday the 23rd with the results coming back on Wednesday the 25th. Uh, a final note, we have added some additional operational posture changes to ensure um, uh, additional safety measures going forward for all public safety operations. But again, uh, this incident highlights the, the importance of uh, all the health and safety guidance that's in place now. And despite the fact that we have a strong operational posture uh, and procedures in place to try to prevent vectoring of this of this nature. Uh, sometimes the timelines uh, interfere with that, and, and these kinds of events can happen. So that's why it's so important uh, to follow the guidance uh, as it's been prescribed by the health department. Thank you. That's my. Uh, I think now we turn it over to uh, Dr. Levine. I hope everyone who's listening had a great Thanksgiving and found creative and novel ways to both enjoy themselves as well as stay connected with friends and family, and maybe even contribute in some way to the pleasure others less fortunate may have had. Regarding the holiday and its potential impact on Vermont's future COVID case counts, I, like uh, Secretary French, was heartened by the New York Times survey conducted through the country which stated that only 27% of Americans plan to dine with people outside their household. That survey was slightly less than a number of other surveys that have been conducted by other entities that estimated about a third of Americans planned to do so. Such surveys probably underestimate reality, as people don't always want to freely admit doing what they've been told not to do. And of course, airports, as we've seen, have been at their busiest since the national emergency began. Nonetheless, the three regions in the country with the fewest people planning to dine outside their households were Washington, D.C., Washington State, and Vermont at about 20%. From my viewpoint, I hope we achieved even lower. We will learn more in 7 to 14 days. Most of us in state government observed the different feel of the holiday this year, the lack of traffic, the airports reported lower holiday and pre-holiday activity. My request to Vermonters who may have participated in travel and or multi-household gatherings is simply this, please quarantine yourselves at home and please get tested now and in seven days. In terms of our case counts, on Wednesday there were 72 cases, and as the governor just stated, three deaths reported. Two of those deaths occurred on November 24th and one on November 22nd. The individual's ages were 76, 81, and 94, and one passed away at home, one in a hospital, and one at a long-term care facility. We express our sympathies to their families. This brings our total deaths to 67. Yesterday, there were 99 cases and no deaths reported. This brings us to yet another landmark, the 4,000 case milestone. Unfortunately, 4,005 cases to be exact. In terms of hospitalizations, there are currently 16 Vermonters hospitalized with COVID, none under investigation, two in an ICU, none on a ventilator. The health department and I are becoming more and more concerned about the increasing number of cases that we're seeing in nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. 
This is causing more patient illnesses and hospitalizations and even deaths. More staff illness and required quarantines and Frank's staffing shortage in a time of national shortage for these facilities. The most recent skilled nursing facility to have an outbreak is Elderwood in Burlington, where included in yesterday's positive results were the results of facility-wide testing. Their current case numbers are 14 residents and two staff. We all know the way COVID spreads through such vulnerable facilities in an often stealthy manner. And almost universally, the virus comes in via an unsuspecting staff member who may have no symptoms at all, or who develops symptoms, but might have worked as usual for the two preceding days before their symptom onset. Because that's how this virus takes advantage of us and operates. So I raise this issue today because I want to again reemphasize the major way we have to protect these facilities is by protecting our communities, lowering the ability of the virus to spread from one person to another. And that is by continuing to avoid gatherings of any sort, especially multi-household gatherings, as well as, of course, avoiding all non-essential travel. And certainly, if one does have to travel, avoiding travel without subsequent quarantine. Obviously, all of our same guidance continues to hold and continues to have increasing validity to it, especially the masking, uh, where more and more evidence is coming out and being published almost on a daily basis regarding the success of that uh, initiative. In addition, we'll be increasing surveillance activities in the long-term care facilities as well as in other health care settings. And speaking of surveillance, you heard Secretary French comment on the teachers and school staff with 21 positives out of almost 9,300 individuals. That comes out to a 0.24% positivity rate. Through the 24th of this month, our average percent positivity rate over a seven-day period was 1.24%. That literally means um, a little more than one in a hundred chance of being positive on a test. Now, a lot of people talk about the fact that the more you test, the more cases you find. And in Vermont, we are finding cases at higher numbers than we have before. We are also doing incredible amount of testing, and now that the college student testing will be diminished because they've gone home on break, we will still have abundant more surveillance testing in the populations I've already mentioned, as well as our on-demand test sites throughout the state. Keep in mind that someone who has no symptoms can test positive at one of these sites. So we feel pretty comfortable with our low percent positivity rate at this point in time, because even as there's a surge in the country and in the region and even in the state to some degree, we're not just learning about the people who feel ill and went to get a test because they felt ill. We're learning about people who went to get a test because they may have been in a gathering, they may have traveled, or they may have other concerns that indicate that they were in contact with someone with COVID. Some of them will have no symptoms but test positive. So our percent positivity rate gives us a very nice finger on the pulse of how much COVID is present in our state. Now I'll turn it over to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll open up to questions at this time. All right, we have 23 in the queue today, and we'll start in the room with Calvin. Uh, thank you, Governor. Um, so the proposal from earlier this week uh, to have schools ask um, students if they gathered over the break, um, we're already hearing from a number of districts that uh, are choosing not to ask students next week. Um, it's gotten, of course, you may have seen, it's gotten some national attention as well. Uh, I'm wondering what, what you make of the response uh, to this policy and, and maybe in the sense of you think it's backfired. Yeah, well, I don't think it's backfired at all. Uh, um, and, and 
I think it's important for us to reflect on what we're asking. A lot of the folks who are watching today may not understand this, may not have kids in school, but for those who do understand the process very well, uh, we have a health check uh, that is, it, is it, uh, uh, implemented and uh, utilized by every student going back to school every single day. Uh, health check on whether they have a, a, a fever, uh, whether they've been sick, uh, and, and other a series of questions. Uh, when, we, when we determined that we we're going to push pause on any travel into the state, a question was asked, uh, in, uh, added to that uh, health check, have you traveled out of state? That, that was on the form as well. Uh, when we determined uh, that in Washington County over uh, uh, like a month and a half period of time, that 71% of all the positive cases were coming from social gatherings, uh, we determined that we needed to limit the number of social gatherings, especially with Thanksgiving coming up, especially with what we saw happen in Canada, uh, the incredible rise in, in the number of cases as a result of travel and mobility around their holiday. Um, so we asked uh, the districts to add one more question. And if you had uh, determined, if you were going to have a gathering with with households outside of your household, we're asking you uh, to be, um, uh, to tell us that. Uh, and uh, you don't even have to get to that point. Uh, I would say if you have had one of those gatherings uh, yesterday, uh, that you shouldn't send your kids to school next week. Uh, that you should quarantine your kids for at least seven days, get a test, uh, and then we'll move forward. Uh, we did all of this to try and protect Vermont, to try and prevent the rise uh, in number of cases. Now, admittedly, uh, there was a lot of uh, reaction to this. We saw it on social media. We've had many, many calls. I think uh, you can chalk that up to either uh, hitting a nerve, it's either a guilt nerve, or just a resistance a nerve. Uh, but the, the, the intent was really to protect Vermonters. And because we're seeing so much community spread that we had to put a stop to it somehow. So uh, this is uh, something the districts uh, can do or, or don't have to do, uh, but we're advising that they have it as part of the questions. But again, I will reiterate, uh, if you had a gathering yesterday uh, that was uh, where, where you had people outside of your households, I would uh, quarantine your children over the next seven weeks or seven uh, days and then have a test. And then you don't have to be asked the question. Right. But as well, I mean, uh, for those who are listening, this isn't something, this isn't like an interrogation of your kids. Uh, for most, most districts do this online. Uh, they ask the parents uh, to, to attest to this. So the uh, parents are the ones who do fill this out uh, and then they do it online. Now, if they don't do it online, uh, it does get down into in-person or uh, a note is sent in with their with their uh, children uh, to the to the schools, but for the most part, it's all done by online. And it's done by parents. Liz, hi, Governor. Um, today is obviously Black Friday. Tomorrow is Small Business Saturday, um, and a lot of Vermonters are probably planning on spending some money at our local retailers in the coming days. How can they do so safely? Yeah, you can adhere, adhere to the, the guidelines we put into place. Um, many of the, the retail operations, uh, if they can just make sure that they're spaced apart and do so in a safe manner, everyone masked up. Uh, and if, you, if you're if you sick, if you have symptoms, don't come in, don't shop. Just take the, the necessary precautions because uh, we we understand uh, that, uh, especially tomorrow with the, some of the smaller retail operations, uh, Small Business Saturday is important uh, to retailers. And I would contend you could do it in a safe way, but it's not going to be the same way you've done it in the past. But just follow the guidelines, a simple procedure, and, and we'll all, and not crowd into it. The retailers themselves will have to determine how many people can come into their uh, their place of operation. But I'm, I'm confident we can get through this, uh, and, uh, and I think everyone's taking this seriously, but we don't want to inhibit them, their ability to shop either or uh, for the retailers uh, to do business. Are you encouraging people to do more online shopping this year then, just because of the pandemic to social 
distance easier? I, th I think what I am saying is we need to spread this out. Uh, maybe not everyone do it all at once. Uh, and to use every uh, day as an opportunity if they want to do it in person, especially with some of the small retailers, uh, just don't do it all on Saturday. Maybe you can do it on Sunday or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. Just spread it out a bit and going uh, during times when it's not as busy. And it's just going to have to be a little bit more creative. I've seen uh, some uh, businesses that have used their uh, entrepreneurial spirit and creativity to do things in a different way that's going to be unique. And But at the same time, I, I think it will keep people safe. Thank you. Um, oh, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think you had such a great answer. I just wanted to, to share with folks who are listening that um, Vermont retailers have worked incredibly hard to try to provide customers um, different kinds of access than they have in the past. They've upgraded online shopping platforms. They are happy to take orders over the phone and provide curbside as well as some delivery. So. We are really hoping that folks do support our local businesses who are um, who are relying on you this, this holiday season. But again, as the governor has mentioned, we want you to do it as safely as possible. And um, again, look for the, a variety of ways that will prevent you from gathering and congregating and creating large crowds. Yeah, thank you, Secretary Curley. Uh, this could be for you, Governor Dr. Levine. You, we have seen the increase. We actually got tipped a little bit on some of the nursing home breakouts. Uh, are you concerned, or or what is the uh, the strategy here? Have have uh, either uh, healthcare workers dropped their dropped the ball a little bit, or dropped their guard, or is it uh, folks coming into these facilities that might be uh, the problem here? I mean, what? What's the concern as far as where we're at with that? Thanks, Steve. Uh, I would say it's neither. Um, the visitation policies still remain pretty strict. Um, and as the weather has cooled off and the uh, rate of disease in the communities has increased, it's only gotten stricter. Uh, with regard to the healthcare workers, I would hate for anyone to point the fingers at the healthcare workers. Uh, because the reality is, uh, as both the governor and I have said today, they all have lives away from work in their communities. Um, and I don't believe they're indiscriminately attending social gatherings that they shouldn't be or leaving the state and coming back without quarantining. They're just subject to the same forces we all are, that they may come in contact with people who have the virus, who have no symptoms and don't know about it. Uh, I mean, that's just the reality of where we are. Um, the, the nice part about the, the data I gave you on teachers, I think if we looked at the overall data on healthcare, as we pick up the surveillance there, we would find something similar, that we're gonna have a very low rate of positivity in those groups, because they're really invested in keeping their work sites clear, whether it be a healthcare work site or an education work site. Um, they, they don't want to shut down the operations at any of those or impact their colleagues who would have to quarantine if they were in contact with them. So I think it's just a sign of where we are really in the whole region with regard to COVID. Thank you. I'd also add, as Dr. Levine reminds us, that when the disease is prevalent in the community, um, that we're going to see more of these outbreaks. Uh, it's just part of the nature of the virus. As well, this virus is so crafty uh, with a number of people, a high percentage, being asymptomatic. So people are unknowingly going to work but are positive uh, and can be spreading uh, unknowingly uh, to others. So it's not as though they're doing it intentionally, uh, but that's why we've, we've uh, continued to upgrade um, and, and to uh, branch out in terms of our testing, uh, on-demand testing that we've uh, we've done uh, over the last uh, week and continue to do over the next uh, few weeks, uh, just to get to more people, uh, so that we can end the surveillance testing, which will be uh, really instrumental in trying to get a handle on this. Pat, WCAX. Good morning. I actually have another question about the long-term care facility outbreaks as well. There was some really helpful data that on Tuesday that 
broke it down really nicely about which facilities had cases, how many there were. Could you update us on that data today, how many facilities have cases right now, which of those incidents are considered outbreak? Yeah, I don't know if Secretary Smith might have any of that information, or it may not be upgraded today because of the, uh, the Thanksgiving holiday. I may ask Secretary Smith if he has the answer to that. Yes, Governor, you, you are correct. It hasn't been updated today. It would normally be updated, but uh, CAT, it hasn't been updated because of the holiday. Uh, what Dr. Levine gave you was the addition of uh, the long-term care facility at Elderwood uh, with the 14 positive in, uh, residents and two staff. I don't have updates on the rest of them. Got it. Uh, well, I've got you on the line, Secretary. Uh, what, can you just reiterate for people what the visitation policy is at the moment for long-term care facilities? Like, are there any facilities that are actually allowing in-person visits at the moment indoors, or given our case counts, have we pretty much stopped doing that at the moment? Yeah. Given the case counts, we've pretty much stopped doing that at the moment. Uh, uh, most, if not all, uh, skilled nursing facilities have restrictions on uh, on visitation, and so I think those will continue until we get uh, the prevalence of the virus in the community under control. We also uh, have stepped up testing in long-term care facilities to weekly now, and may even go uh, uh, even more further uh, than uh, than weekly. So we are testing staff weekly. Uh, we've we have. Uh, uh, put fairly significant restrictions on uh, on visitation just to keep try to keep these uh, facilities safe. Thank you, Joel, the Burlington Free Press. <clears throat> Joel, it's star six on mute. Last call for Joel. We'll move to Mike Donahue at the Islander. Uh, yeah. My star six button seems to, to be soft. It, can I? Can you all hear me now? Yeah. Go ahead, Joel. We'll we'll get back to you, Mike. Okay. okay. Um, you know, Governor, uh, it it sounds like um, in the medium term, like in the coming year, there is cause. Uh, at least cautious cause for optimism um, with the with vaccines and so forth. I was wondering uh, when your administration might begin, or maybe it already has begun, um, establishing what protocols uh, might be useful to implement and have ready for the next uh, the next pandemic, if, if it comes in five years, 10 years, um, what what aspects of the economy and, and the health establishment, uh, or health professionals anyway, might be put in place in anticipation of something that is almost certainly going to return, um, or is, is your administration just so caught up right now in what's working now and what isn't. Uh, but I'd be interested in knowing how how state government is is going to change uh, as a result of this, and whether or not some some things are are being um, bookmarked anyway for for the future. Yeah, um, you know, you can look back uh, to the start of this and and how we've evolved since the very beginning. We've learned so much, uh, and we've tried to be strategic in some of the, the guidelines, restrictions we've been putting into place of late because we know what works, what doesn't, how the virus acts, and, and learn more every day. But we're going to um, have to continue to evaluate after this is over to see what we do uh, in terms of uh, protecting ourselves for the future. Uh, as well, you know, we're going to be uh, through every type of situation, whether it was Irene, we, we learned a lot from Irene and, and we've uh, 
uh, put in a lot of uh, steps, uh, you know, mitigated uh, a lot of areas of concern in terms of flooding and, and so forth uh, that we're continuing to do today. So we learned from that and did things differently so we didn't end up in the same situation at, if they had another when and if uh, there is another flooding event. Um, as well, uh, with this virus, um, we're going to uh, do things differently. Across state government, for instance, uh, I think uh, being remote, uh, working from home, is, uh, is going to become more prevalent uh, that even after we uh, have the vaccine in place and, uh, and we get back to somewhat normal. That will be the new normal uh, and for a lot of folks uh, across state government. So we'll, we'll take, uh, we'll glean as much of the good, uh, all the silver linings, uh, and there are many uh, throughout this pandemic. We may not see them uh, right now, uh, but they will surface as we, uh, as we move our way out of this. And then we'll, we'll learn from this uh, experience and we'll learn what works and what works better and uh, we'll continue to do that. So again, it's a little too, too early uh, to plan for that, but, but at the same time, we're keeping track. And, and again, we do this every single day uh, to reflect on what's working, what isn't, and what we can do to help ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand. And we'll all stay tuned. And uh, thanks very much for your time. I'm gonna let Dr. Ooh. Levine add to that. Just, just to give a tiny addition, um, you're right, there will be another pandemic. I hope five years is uh, not, not as soon as it comes. Uh, but looking at the pace of things over the last 20 years, possibly. Uh, but the reality is, I think the lesson that needs to be learned the most is a national lesson. And again, I'm not pointing at one administration or another, because this spans a number of administrations over the last 20 years, to be accurate. Uh, where funding for pandemic preparedness and emergency preparedness from a public health standpoint has not been uh, valued. And it's actually been uh, actively taken away over time. So I think the country needs to learn this lesson because a state like Vermont, like every other state in the country, is dependent upon federal funding that usually filters down through the CDC and then gets a portion to all of the states. And these activities are valued and important, but they can only be as uh, robustly funded as the federal funding that comes into the states to help support them. So I think that that lesson will be clearly learned because other pandemics or potential pandemics, they didn't really impact anybody in the way this one has, whether we're talking about the H1N1 flu, the Zika virus, Ebola virus, um, none of those have any kind of impact compared to what COVID-19 is all about. So I think as a country we'll learn that lesson and the states like Vermont will be able to have even a more robust response. Uh, not that we didn't in the beginning, um, the next time around. All right, well, thank you very much. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, first thing, could we get a clarification from Commissioner Sherling on the St. Albans State Police Act and the 15 people I think were involved in the search warrant? Uh, just trying to confirm they were all state police members or were there agencies like St. Albans, Swanton Police, Sheriff, Federal Agency, or any drug task force that have other Police Department's represented. Sure, Commissioner Shirley. Yes, uh, thanks, Governor. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it's just uh, 15 folks from uh, within the state police uh, that were present at that briefing. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Governor, uh, there seems to be some confusion if a deer camp visitation is still a quarantine situation as originally announced, and with the deer season coming to an end, is co-workers are going to be returning to work. To, and we've heard employers are now saying that only those exposed to a confirmed COVID case of deer camp need to be quarantined. Because of that belief, some have already returned without quarantining, much to the dismay of some of their colleagues. Uh, reader asks for clarification would be greatly appreciated and benefit 
the general population. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, I, if they were returning from deer camp with members of different households, uh, they would have to quarantine. But Dr. Levine is shaking his head. Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. And the second question is probably for Commissioner French. The freedom decision by the Supreme Court requires equal education across Vermont, with students having the benefit of in classroom experience and some doing long distance and some hybrid. First, is a distinct possibility in the coming weeks that some schools will shut down while others continue, and there is a distinct difference between in person learning versus long distance. How does the Agency of Education in the state of Vermont plan to ensure children do, in fact, at the same level of education as required by the Supreme Court? And can you actually give specific, not just generalities, but specific how kids in Burlington and Barry are going to get the same education as Bennington, Brattleboro, Barton, and whoever? I think that's a great question. Okay. Secretary French. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I think it's important to note that the uh, learning of all students, I think, has been adversely affected. Uh, as I mentioned in my remarks today, I think the first step in doing that is going to be some focused time on assessing the impact. Um, unfortunately, right now, it's, it's really hard for us to do that until we have uh, more in-person instruction. So the priority right now is going to need to remain uh, operating our schools safely as, as best we can, particularly through this holiday period. Um, but I'm hoping to turn the corner on that, uh, particularly with the advent of the vaccine, so that we can uh, put more focused effort on first assessing uh, the impact. And that's why <clears throat> the conversation about uh, testing is so important. On the one hand, um, it's, it's hard to contemplate how that testing might provide useful information from an accountability standpoint. But on the other hand, we need to have some commonly used assessment tool across the state that allows us to begin to prioritize um, the impact um, particularly uh, from an equity standpoint. So I think the first step will be that assessment piece, but we're not gonna be able to start that until uh, after the first year. Okay, thank you all very much, appreciate it. Thank you. Guy Page, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Governor, the Supreme Court ruled a couple days ago that the state of New York may not restrict religious practices as part of its, its COVID regulation. Uh, what effect will that ruling have on uh, your executive orders regarding religious services? Yeah, um, Guy, we're trying to, to assess that at this point in time. From, from our initial standpoint, it appears that this reaffirms that, that what we're doing here in Vermont is the correct path. Uh, that we haven't done what New York has done, and that we have restricted uh, based on occupancy rate, uh, but not those caps that uh, that New York did. So, I believe, uh, from again, from my standpoint, I think it's good news for Vermont, and and just uh, reaffirms that what we're doing is correct. Okay, so you're saying because it's it's uh, occupancy rates and not caps, we're we're probably in the clear with that. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's based on equity and, and uh, we're doing it across the board, so it's not as though we're pointing at one particular sector. Okay, thank you. Second question is, uh, I understand, uh, uh, could you tell me what the development of your thinking is on whether vaccination of, of COVID will need to be mandatory at some level? Yeah, we're, we're, it's way too early for that, uh, again. Uh, from my standpoint, uh, just uh, as we see some of these uh, vaccines come into place, uh, we have to prove that they're safe and, uh, and effective, and we're going to learn a lot. Uh, and we don't have enough for everyone at this point in time, and it's going to be many, many months before that, uh, that is even the case. Uh, but I think it's important, and Dr. Levine can probably speak to this better than I can, uh, but it's going to be important uh, for us once we determine uh, that there are some safe vaccines out there uh, that uh, we ask for monitors to, to, to do this voluntarily so that we can get above a certain percentage because we don't get above a certain uh, percentage. It's just not effective uh, to, uh, to counteract uh, this virus. So 
uh, there's a there's a rate, uh, there's a magic number somewhere. Uh, I think it's around 70 percent. Uh, where if we can get above that, then we'll we'll contain it with this uh, herd immunity uh, of sorts. So, uh, Dr. Levine, can you add to that? Yes, Governor, the number is in the 70-ish percent range, give or take a little. Um, it's it's not precise, uh, but based on what I told you earlier about the percent positivity rates in our testing, we know that there are not going to be large numbers of Vermonters who have already acquired some immunity on their own uh, by coming in contact with this virus. So the vaccine will have to, in a parallel pathway, add to that number. Um, from a federal standpoint and from all the, uh, plenty, the plenty of advisory panels that are out there, uh, there is no talk of uh, mandating vaccine use um, in the country. Uh, so if a state chose to do that, that would be uh, different. But again, uh, I think it's so early in the game to be talking about those things. I really do think we need to see the uptake. I had a call with a number of hospitals today who have informally surveyed their staff. And uh, they're coming up with 50 to 60 percent of their staff at this point in time would say that they would line up first for the vaccine. Now, some may say, well, that's not very much. I'm a class half full person. I would say that's phenomenal because they don't even know anything about the vaccine yet. They've had a few news reports talking about 90 percent effectiveness and what have you. But in terms of really an informed consent process where you know everything you need to know about the vaccine so you can make the right decision, you and your health care provider or you on your own, um, that's really phenomenal that people already are thinking so much of this. Uh, that they're putting themselves in that pool of people who would take it. So I think that will only grow with the confidence that I hope will come from uh, an accurate news reports about what is coming out and what it's capable of doing and the fact that there may be very minimal adverse effects as we're hearing in the preliminary way. So it seems like a fairly safe vaccine to you so far, what you're seeing? So, so far it does, you know, except for the usual things about discomfort at the site of the injection um, and perhaps a day of low-grade fever or fatigue in some, but not many. Mm -hmm. But again, I don't want to say that that's uh, gospel at this point in time because we just haven't got enough information uh, to, to be accurate about saying that. Okay, thank you. Greg, the Bennington Banner. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Um, my questions are, I believe, are for Secretary French, if that's okay? Sure. Okay, um, my first is about the surveillance testing. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us where those 21 test positive test results uh, came from in terms of which, which district and whether any were concentrated in a single school. Yeah, hi, Greg. The health department will keep providing more reporting on that, so I don't have the specifics of where they were, but they were spread out around the state. Okay, do you know if anyone from the, the, the two southern Vermont counties? Uh, I don't have that data with me at the moment. Okay. Um, my second question then is um, about the, um, the, the, uh, the question asking folks about multifamily uh, gatherings and having the quarantine otherwise. Um, was there any indication of how many districts opted out of that out of that question? And did they reach out to you on that, and the, or was there discussion about that sort of in the process? And also, were any of those um, districts uh, decided to opt out here in the southern two counties? Yeah, I don't have specific information on uh, opting out or not. I think you know that'll uh, likely uh, become more clear on Monday after Thanksgiving. Uh, but we did have a lot of uh, contact with uh, districts as we, we published that guide uh, late Monday afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, okay, can you, can, you, can you tell me generally what those conversations were like in terms of what their concerns were? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, starting on uh, when, the, when the executive order down and was published on Friday, um, districts had many questions as to, um, you know, what their role would be in implementing that. Particularly, I heard from superintendents who were uh, struggling uh, with the idea that some parents might be less than truthful. Um, so we endeavored to provide some uh, additional guidance for them, and that ultimately culminated in the public's publishing of our guidance on Monday. 
uh, but this balance um, districts are trying to strike between um, sort of, I would say, enforcement, but more in the lines of implementing the guidance as a tool for them to keep their schools safe. So on the one hand, um, schools felt challenged, I think, to go beyond what would there be their traditional authority. On the other hand, uh, they do have authority and responsibility for ensuring that everyone uh, in their school buildings is safe. Uh, so I think as you saw some, some of the media coverage, there were some superintendents who uh, were looking for more specificity um, and additional tools and guidance from the state where others felt uh, within their own uh, current authority that they had the ability to navigate the issue. So it's, it's hard to um, challenging issues the governor alluded to, but you know, our bottom line was I think we're just trying to keep everyone safe and equip schools with the tools uh, they need to do that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. That concludes my question. Greg, the county courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, just a quick follow-up on the state police situation with St. Albans. Was that linked to any uh, long-term care facility uh, outbreak? I don't have that information. Uh, I think uh, Commissioner Sherling, I think you said that there was a, a connection with a healthcare worker, but I don't know in what uh, what setting that was. Uh, that's correct, Governor. It is a healthcare worker, but that's all we know. Um, I don't have that level of granular detail. Okay. And um, I guess my second question for the day, uh, we've heard about an outbreak at St. Albans Health and Rehab. I'm wondering what you can tell us. I, obviously, the outbreak at the Rutland facility wasn't disclosed until it was brought up by media. So what can you disclose about the, the outbreak in St. Albans? Again, I just want to correct the record on that one, Greg. Um, we did disclose uh, that uh, Rutland Regional had an issue uh, as it was unfolding. I mean, it happened quickly. So I think uh, Secretary Smith did mention that uh, during that briefing, but uh, but again, it spread and he did, but it was in response to a, a media member's question, uh, uh, specifically asking about the Rutland facility. So I I guess I'm wondering what's going on in St. Albans because it seems like uh, you know we don't always hear about the outbreaks until they're brought up in the media. Sure. Craig, we have also just for the record added the weekly update, which was presented on Tuesday, with all of the long-term care facilities with an outbreak. Secretary, uh, Commissioner, what do you think? Governor, I can, no, wait. No, it's okay, Secretary. Um, Governor, you're absolutely right. I mean, that situation was breaking. I was getting texts during, during the press conference on that situation. It was breaking as we were holding the press conference. The question came up, I answered the question, in terms of what I knew at the time. So we weren't sort of, uh, the situation was a breaking situation at the same time. It, St. Albans does, uh, I'll, I'll leave it to Dr. Levine to update, but I, I, don't, I don't have an update, but I think there are some uh, cases in the facility that you just talked about, but uh, uh, Dr. Levine? Thank you. And I don't have a, an update for the last day or so, but I was, I was aware of a case there. And it was, again, very similar to what I've described uh, today in my opening remarks. Somebody who worked while asymptomatic, only to become symptomatic and find out that they were indeed a case. Uh, so again, I think rather than pointing at one facility or another, we need to just accept the general theme that there's a prevalence of virus in the state and in our communities, and people, no matter where they go to work, are going to go to work feeling fine, not realizing they're capable of transmitting the virus to others. So am I hearing from you that, as far as the state knows, it's only one case at, at that facility? Uh, I, I, no, uh, only as far as I know this moment. Uh, I, I suspect we may know more than that. I just don't have that information in front of me right now due to the holiday. Okay, perhaps your uh, office can get back to me on that today? Absolutely. 
Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Meet Hirschfeld, BPR. Uh, Dr. Levine, the 21 positive results from the surveillance testing in public schools, have any of those results um, initiated an investigation by your department into a possible situation or outbreak in any individual district? So any positive result in a facility like a school obviously gets can, one connects with the uh, individual who, we, who is now a case. Uh, they are given the proper guidance about what they should do. And then we determine, based on the time we think they may have been infectious, what else needs to be done in terms of contacts to that case that might need quarantine or what have you. So these are handled like anybody who became symptomatic at the school and wasn't a surveillance test, but was a, a case finding exercise where they had symptoms and wanted to see if they had COVID and then we find out they do and we do the same thing. So it's an automatic when there's a situation in a school that we pursue that. Um, fortunately, it's almost never resulted in more serious consequences within the school, which is great. But you don't have any concerns at this point about a potential outbreak in a district based on the results of that first round of surveillance testing? Uh, no, not at this point in time. Um, and then a quick one for Commissioner, uh, uh, Secretary French. I understood really clearly what the upsides would be to standardized testing, um, i.e. revealing potential uh, increases in inequities. Um, what, it, what exactly is the downside to, to standardized testing? Well, I think, you know, as, as referenced, the name standardized, the idea that uh, we would get some predictable and uniform results. And I think, you know, the conditions for learning have been so unequal across the state, um, it really then becomes hard to sort of start to do the inferential comparisons, you know, apples to apples, so to speak, uh, when we've had uh, so many different uh, configurations. I think the other aspect is really about logistics of the testing I alluded to briefly. Um, it's not clear yet, if, you know, what will the circumstances will be like when we'll actually be able to implement the test. The SBAC, for example, is a uh, computer-based uh, assessment um, that I, I still believe requires in-person uh, instruction in order to implement. So we're not able to necessarily implement that assessment in a remote capacity. So, um, you know, those are sort of the big questions, you know, sort of the uniformity of the conditions that we're assessing and also uh, logistical implementation of the assessment itself. All right, but it's not that uh, districts might be subject to some kind of sanction or penalty because they didn't perform very well? Yeah, I don't think so as much. I mean, the uh, ESSA, the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act, is fundamentally different in that regard from the No Child Left Behind Act, uh, but certainly um, you know, has a focus on identifying those schools, particularly from a uh, comprehensive needs perspective, so that we can allocate additional federal resources to assist. But the accountability structure is uh, basically fundamentally different than it was under No Child Left Behind Act. Thank you very much. Mark, VT Digger. He said we're all kind of grasping for some kind of hope out there, but um, uh, what are you basing this idea that there's light at the end of the tunnel given the, the really grim statistics that you laid out earlier in the week? And, you know, are, are you providing false hope and isn't this premature? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's false hope, um, Mark. Uh, I believe, you know, with the vaccines that have come out at a record pace, uh, this is really remarkable uh, from, I think, all of our perspectives. Um, so that's hope, that's good news. What we're doing here in Vermont um, has been remarkable as well that we've been able to, even though our case numbers have increased over the last uh, month, uh, we still are the lowest in the nation in terms of uh, many of the measures that we've been highlighting over the last uh, number of months. Um, as well with what we're learning, uh, what we're doing, we're, uh, we're increasing our testing, we're increasing our surveillance testing uh, and on-demand testing so that if you want a test, you can get a test. I mean, there are all kinds of things that we're putting into place and learning 
um, so that we can better uh, control and mitigate uh, this virus. So again, I think, uh, again, from my perspective, there is hope out there. And, uh, and again, um, with, the, uh, with, the, with the vaccines that are coming uh, into uh, to full view, uh, two so far, possibly a third, and there are a number of, of other vaccines behind them uh, that are being uh, tested at this point as well. So, again, maybe it's a uh, half uh, glass half full uh, perspective, but uh, but I think we need a little bit of hope, and I think this provides it. Uh, Commissioner Levine, anything you can add to that gives you hope? Yeah. I think we've learned so much and we've come so far. And as the governor points out, we've really been leaders in the country in this. And not that I want us to learn how to live with the virus and still think our lives are normal, but to some degree, we've been able to do that in Vermont uh, for a pretty long time. And now if we find the vaccines become a game changer, that'll only get us there that much faster. So. I do think that um, the pace of knowledge and the pace of that knowledge being usable is really, really important. Um, and just to give you a, a few examples where Vermont has played a direct role, Vermont, um, for uh, that one report about contact tracing and how many minutes cumulative you were in contact with someone instead of just the straightforward 15 minute rule, six foot, um, was a game changer for the country in terms of being able to really help protect more people. The CDC is talking now about uh, letting people get out of quarantine sooner than 14 days. And Vermont has for a long time had the rule that you can test out on day seven if you have no symptoms up until that point in time, and that's really stood us well along this time. So we've, we've done a lot, I think, to try to really improve how we have to deal with the virus, and that should be something positive, and we continue to grow in that way, because optimistic as we are about the vaccine, we know that not every person's gonna get the vaccine before Christmas, and there's gonna be a number of months that go by in 2000. 21 that um, we have to endure uh, kind of doing everything we're doing now plus getting more uptake of the vaccine but that should be a positive sign for everyone because it really does mean we can sort of start to plan our futures again and i see that as something that's uh, very reality based at this point so stay tuned i made a second question for the governor governor yes yesterday that on the president said that he would honor the results of the Electoral College and actually move out of the White House. A recent poll had 52% of Republicans thought that Trump rightfully won the election. Um, to what degree has his actions and comments undermined the integrity of the electoral process? And what should be done to restore that? And did the National Governors Association do enough on this? Well, again, I, I would classify myself in that 48 percent aisle of, of those who feel that the election was, uh, was legitimate um, and we should move on. I think this is a sign. Uh, again, I think if you went back uh, maybe uh, two weeks ago, that number was higher. So the percentage is moving in the right direction. Um, I think, I, I, you know, we need to move on uh, from this, uh, all of us, even individually. Uh, and focus on what's really important to us at this point in time. I'd say the pandemic is the highest priority at this point. Uh, and having uh, the president-elect come in uh, and, and uh, communicating that, having the Congress uh, be able to, to really focus on that as well and give us uh, some of the help we'll need, some of the stimulus we'll need to, to work our way out of this as the vaccine is distributed is going to be incredibly important uh, to, to America. And, um, you know, as far as what the National Governors Association has done, I think uh, we have tried to work together uh, in many different ways, um, but I'm not sure that we could do anything different uh, than what was done. I, I, I believe the, the uh, election 
uh, was uh, legitimate, um, was safe, uh, effective, and the results uh, will stand. And, uh, and I think the, the more governors who come to that conclusion, the better off we'll be. And we're seeing them every single day. And we're seeing other uh, leaders uh, across the country uh, come to that conclusion. And it appears uh, the, that President Trump has, uh, has at least come to the conclusion that uh, he will not be in office uh, after uh, the end of January. So you don't think he's undermined the integrity of the electoral process? I, I don't. I, I think he's put it into question, um, but uh, but I think as time moves on, uh, we will uh, move on as well, and uh, and and all determine that this was a legitimate election, and uh, we'll see what happens in four years. But uh, from my perspective, uh, I think again, I don't think it undermined it, but it did uh, it did put a, a, a bit of a a bruise on it, but uh, but I don't think it undermined it. Thank you. Tim, from Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I have a question about masks, or believe it or not. And, but I have a, just wanted to clarify uh, the recent, the three recent deaths. It appears that one was in Orleans County and two were in Bentham County. I just want to make sure that's correct. I don't believe that's correct, but I don't have uh, the data on that. I, I, I just don't, and we'll. We'll have more as time moves on, but uh, and we can get that to you. But, but I don't believe that's correct. Okay. Um, as far as the mask wearing is concerned, there's, there's more and more chatter about um, now that, that people who recovered uh, are starting to pile up. There's over two thousand here in Vermont, but nationally, of course, a lot more people saying, "Oh, I don't have to wear a mask anymore uh, because I've had COVID, I've recovered." And therefore, I'm in good shape, and no one else is going to get it from me, et cetera, et cetera. And I just wanted maybe Dr. Levine clarify that, clarify that whole point, especially as we go inside more. There's got to be um, uh, increased training. Yeah, I think it's important to clarify that because I, I don't think there's been enough data to show uh, whether you can get it again or whether you can get it again and transmit either. Um, we just don't know enough about the virus. And I'll concur. I, <clears throat> I wouldn't want people to think that they're totally invincible if they've had a case. There are more and more cases in the literature being reported of uh, reinfection, sometimes with an actual different strain of the same virus. Uh, so um, I, I think to protect everyone, it, you know, wearing a mask is probably not asking a tremendous amount if you've had an infection previously. It'll also save you from being questioned yourself if you're walking into stores without a mask or into gatherings where people would have masks on. Um, probably save you a lot of explaining and issues like that. But I think with our knowledge of the virus being what it is, it would be premature for people who have had an infection that was documented to think that they don't need to wear a mask, or for that matter, don't need to engage in any of the other uh, guidances that we talk about in terms of physical distancing, et cetera. Is, is there uh, data about whether you're still a carrier or not whether you can be a carrier, just a, just a, a transporter of the virus? Because you're, you're so, okay. so there is this phenomenon called persistent positive person, which means that even three months after you presumably resolved your infection, you felt well for weeks and weeks, but you get tested and you still test positive. Most of those people we believe are testing positive because the test is accurate enough to find fragments of the virus, but the virus is not viable and able to infect anyone else. So uh, that partially answers your question, I'm sure. Um, to the best of our ability at this point in time. But it doesn't mean um, people months down the road have the ability to infect somebody else. And that, that we feel pretty comfortable with. Okay, thank you. Can I I'll just add one more thing? Uh, because we are entering cold and flu season, uh, and the mass might prevent you from either transmitting 
or receiving um, a cold or a flu. So we don't need to complicate things right now. Uh, and having uh, the flu symptoms is similar uh, to some of the COVID um, coronavirus symptoms. So um, it'd be better if we just all wore the mask for now uh, to take, you know, to help prevent uh, the overwhelming of our healthcare system in other regards as well. Wilson, the Associated Press. Um, hi, everybody. Um, as usual, happy Friday, Black Friday at that. Um, I'm curious, I guess it's for Dr. Levine or whoever might like to answer it. Going forward, as people start to get vaccinated, and presumably then they will be at least 90% of them will, has there been any thought about providing people with uh, cards saying, I have been vaccinated, you know, similar to the uh, uh, the inoculation cards that you used to carry with your passports years ago? And if not, do you think those would be helpful to have for things, any, any number of things that you could use them for? You're traveling to Canada or going into big events or who knows what. Um, so it's a wide open question. So it's probably not a lot of specificity, but I'd be curious about your thoughts about that. Sure. Uh, so from a health standpoint, uh, we, we're going to have to learn what exactly that means. So if you get the um, vaccine, we would probably want to prove that you have antibodies that your body has now generated that could fight off the virus if you got exposed to it. And then we'd want to know how long those antibodies would be measurable and still stay good, etc. So that's the kind of stuff we're looking to these trials to help us figure out because the trials will begin to show uh, over months and months uh, what the person's antibody response is like, uh, how effective it is in the long term. Early indications are that this vaccine would not have to be re-administered you know, several times in the next year or what have you. It could go years and years. But obviously this is the kind of stuff we have to learn, which would make it very important to uh, if you were going to have a policy of giving somebody a card, you'd have to know what exactly that card meant. Because uh, just showing a date of vaccination may, may not be sufficient. So we'll look to some of the national and regional advisory panels to help us with that part. But from another uh, vantage point, um, I could perceive uh, governments, whether they be state, national, international, uh, maybe having similar expectations. And if you get off a plane in a European country, would they want to see the fact that you had your card with you or not? That's a different level of, uh, ex of an exercise uh, when it comes to the policies that governments would, would, would actually put up. Now, hopefully they would be as informed by the kind of information I answered the question with originally from a public health and medical standpoint. So we know exactly what they were looking for was reasonable and realistic and was going to protect their population in the way they wanted to. So I think you're a little early with your question, um, but it's a great question. And it's one that everyone needs to be able to answer shortly after these vaccines come out. Well, yeah, that's why I asked. I mean, this is starting to presumably. I mean, as, as the new year goes along, I, again, I presume there's going to be an avalanche amount of growing numbers of people who will have been vaccinated. And they might want to go to Europe or Montreal or whatever. Um, exactly. So, okay, thank you. Yep. No, they might want to do all of the above. And that's why the trials themselves will help inform the answer to the question. Okay, thank you. James, VT Digger. Me? We can. Can you hear me? We can. Um, thanks for taking the question. So, the state, um, in recent weeks, you, you've taken steps to prepare for kind of the continuing possibility of a surge in cases, um, including planning testing over the past couple of weeks and building um, field hospital in Essex Junction. You also mentioned the sort of new focus on long-term care testing. And I'm wondering what the kind of possibility of continued high cases um, going forward, what additional measures 
the state considering to account for a possible surge? Well, again, I, I, I believe I, I'm getting the flavor uh, of the question is, you know, what we're doing uh, to, in anticipation of the next surge. Um, we're hoping we're in that surge, and it may be a, an elongated surge, but we're hoping that this is uh, one of the last surges uh, before the vaccine's in place, and that's why we're ramping up. Um, the on-demand testing uh, isn't uh, fully implemented. Uh, we're doing that. Uh, the surveillance testing that we've spoken about isn't fully implemented, but we're expanding that. Uh, so we're going to continue to do what we're doing uh, today and uh, continue to watch the data and the science and and then make a, a determination as to if we need to do anything next. Uh, our hope is uh, that we don't, uh, that this will work. We'll see uh, in a couple of weeks, as Dr. Levine had, uh, had alluded to in his earlier comments, we'll see in a um, seven to, to, to 14 days uh, what effect uh, Thanksgiving had on us and what, uh, uh, what, uh, what, is, what does that look like. So um, we'll, we'll continue to just monitor the situation and make changes as we need to. But at this point in time, we're hoping uh, that what we're doing is, uh, is going to work. Dr. Levine. And the, and the only thing to add is uh, we're also on an ongoing weekly basis augmenting our contact tracing workforce. So if there is more to deal with in terms of the fallout from a holiday, um, we're prepared to handle that. I would prefer that the new workforce be just twiddling their thumbs and have nothing to do. Uh, so hopefully that prophecy will, will come real. But uh, I think in terms of other kind of mitigation measures, I think we've taken the appropriate set of mitigation measures and uh, we, we will go with them and see what the data shows. Okay, I was also wondering if you're able to quantify how much you're hoping to up testing in long-term care facilities in the coming weeks, the way you mentioned you're hoping to do. Sure. Um, and I'll let Secretary Smith uh, augment anything I say, but uh, first of all, um, we want to make sure that at a minimum, weekly testing of all of the staff in these facilities is accomplished. We're also investigating perhaps the opportunity to do more daily testing um, in, a, in our more vulnerable uh, settings, um, possibly with use of antigen cards in those settings. Yes, and, and Dr. Levine, you hit it right on the head here. I, the, the only thing I would add is that remember if we have one positive of a resident, we do a series of facility-wide testing as well. So uh, until we feel comfortable that we have a good understanding of the prevalence in the virus of the virus in that facility. Thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Um, hello, good night. Given what we know now um, about the state's resources, uh, and assuming nothing changes radically between now and the legislature coming back into session in January, um, are there any requests that you plan to make to the legislature in its early days that you hope to see carried out quickly? Um, that's to be determined. We're still working on that, and uh, at this point in time, we're still trying to get through uh, December. Uh, we may have a, a request or two to the Joint Fiscal Committee uh, if we find additional funds that have not been spent thus far with CRF funds. Uh, we want to make sure that we implement them in a way that's uh, most effective and most helpful uh, to the most vulnerable and to our businesses and so forth. So we'll continue to, to work along that line, uh, but, uh, but at the same time, uh, we're still building our budget, we're still building uh, some of our policies, and if we see something uh, that, uh, that we'd like them to take up, uh, we will. I, I would add one of them uh, would be uh, town meeting day. Uh, what are we going to do? And, uh, and if this, this virus, it appears, will be still prevalent, uh, in Vermont, and, uh, and from my standpoint, I'd like to see if we can implement uh, some sort of mail-in uh, ballot uh, type of approach, uh, in a, much like the general election, 
uh, that we do it for town meeting. So I, I would hope that we would uh, we would have something along those lines that would have to be have to be addressed early on the session, probably within the first uh, two weeks. Thank you very much. Dave Free, WCAX. My question is for Secretary Smith. We're wondering if we could get an update on the uh, housing of the homeless population and the motel and hotels and what's the latest status on that. We have about uh, 1,700 um, people that are now housed in our hotels. That's an approximate number, uh, including. Uh, children that are in our motel. So we have a fairly robust uh, hotel uh, voucher, motel voucher program that's going on as we enter the, the cold months. We also have um, various facilities and ramping up those facilities right now for those that are COVID positive cases that are, that are in our, uh, our motel, hotel voucher system. So that if you become positive, we will move to various facilities that we have around the state. But it's approximately 1,700 um, uh, people that are in the hotel motel voucher program. And I can get you a specific number. And matter of fact, I will get you the specific number after the press conference. And just a quick follow up what is this being done about safety in these uh, these areas? We have a, um, a safety officer that looks at all these facilities. If there are issues with the facilities, the recommendations from the safety officer is, is uh, taken into account and moved uh, that, and if there is a safe, unsafe condition, we will move families uh, out of that unsafe uh, uh, situation. Thank you. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Oh, I skipped. Sorry. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Thank you. This is probably for uh, Dr. Levine. Um, the, uh, the surveillance testing on the school staff uh, seems like great news for schools. Um, but I'm wondering from a public health standpoint, um, in the sense that it, it, its tool as a surveillance test, um, it, is that providing uh, a representative sample when the general public in the state's testing has been coming back at above 1%? Um, and to follow on the topic, I'm wondering if there are testing opportunities um, and strategies that the, that the general public could adopt uh, that might bolster uh, surveillance testing um, in the sense of, of uh, you know, whether there's um, a good point to encourage households to have at least one member tested every so often or um, encouraging businesses to see if they can find employees to volunteer to get tested uh, on a rotating basis. Great. So uh, your first question, um, you know, the teachers are and it's not just teachers, we should expand that. It's teachers and other staff who work in the schools. That, that is just a segment of our population. Um, so if they were the only population we were testing, uh, that would be of concern. Uh, I'd like to think, though, that teachers and uh, kitchen staff and custodial staff, et cetera, are representative of our communities in many ways. So I'm kind of heartened by that data. The reason that number is different from the overall positivity rate in the state, of course, is because by definition, the population you're doing surveillance testing on has no symptoms and is feeling fine, whereas the population you're doing the overall testing on includes those people, plus includes people who have symptoms and aren't feeling fine. So you would expect it to be a higher number. Um, but I think it's really important that we get at this rate of how many people who have no symptoms but have the virus uh, are out there. And so this is pretty helpful. I know teachers have a wide age range. Uh, many of them, though, are very young uh, and might be in the group that might not have a significant illness and think they're feeling fine. So I think it's reassuring. But of course, 
you know, we have a whole body of people in long-term care facilities, a whole body in the correctional system, a whole body in our greater health care system. So we'll get, we'll get at the, uh, the truth, if you will, the reality of truth, uh, by having multiple populations that all give us surveillance information. With regard to a general Vermonter recommendation, I really would have a Vermonter really evaluate closely the life they're leading and their ability, not just because they want to be good about it, but just the reality of their ability to comply with all of the guidance that we give in terms of their own personal hygiene, their own ability to distance at all times, their own ability to wear their mask, their ability to, in, to not engage in activities that would be in a crowded setting or in a uh, location where there's multiple gatherings and people might have their masks on, um, or their travel history. All those things should go into the things that they factor into um, <clears throat> making a decision about getting a test on any given day uh, or with any regularity. And I think we recognize there are people who are in very uh, public-facing uh, professions, the person who drives the bus, the person who works at the grocery store, etc. Uh, all of our retail workers, for that matter, uh, many are able to keep quite separate from their clientele, but at the same time, they may have concerns based on things that may be unavoidable at their work site. So I think if Vermonters just weigh all of these things in the balance, they'll come up with a comfortable answer. Uh, to the question about should I get tested or should I get repetitively tested? And I think it would be an answer we could all respect. I think they should err on the side of uh, leaning towards testing that rather than not if they have any question though. Because again, this virus is so uh, stealthy and at times uh, unpredictable. Hope that answers your question. Uh, it does, thank you. Uh, a quick one for Secretary Fred. Um, the, the guidance to the app students or uh, as part of the check-in um, about whether they were part of a, a social gathering, is it in line with that guidance that if the answer is yes and the student is uh, expected to quarantine, that those days of quarantine would be considered uh, an absence and um, the school wouldn't necessarily provide uh, remote education opportunities to the kids on those days? No, thanks. I think uh, school districts, if that's the case, should endeavor to provide remote learning to those students. Uh, if they're unable to do so, then it would be an absence. But if they are, I and mean, we have specific attendance provisions for remote learning, if they are able to do it in accordance with those provisions, it would not count as an absence. Um, and so we have some, uh, at least one district in the kingdom that's on a hybrid model um, um, with alternating school days and, and, and a message to families that indicated that uh, because the school does not have a fully remote operation, uh, the days in which the kids would typically be on their in-person lessons, uh, they are not in a position to be able to provide curriculum lessons on, on those absence days. Does that, um, does that stand up to what your expectation would be? Yeah, I mean, you could imagine uh, in those kinds of situations, uh, districts would struggle to reach out and provide additional support to those students. Uh, but there certainly are uh, ways they can do that. Uh, but it, once again, it could uh, could result in an absence if districts aren't able to do that. Uh, but certainly, I think with the increased ability for remote learning that we have now, I hope that uh, most of those students would have their needs met. Okay, thank you very much. All right, and the queue got a little out of order. Sorry about that. So we're going to go back to Chris Roy, and after Chris will be Cam Davis. So Chris, go ahead. Yes, good afternoon. I guess this goes back to the governor's opening remarks. And now that we're in the holiday season, how can people stop engaging press, especially when they can't go to their loved ones and their family? Um, what and what advice should families be looking out for when who they think somebody might be, be depressed in their extended family? Um, maybe you could just give me that question again. I don't, I don't know if I got the whole thing. Yeah, sure. What's the holiday season? People get depressed anyway, that now that 
they may not be able to go out as much, they can't visit with their extended family. Um, how can they prevent depression? And how, what should families look for if they, are, if they believe they have a, fam a loved one who is depressed? Yeah, depression is a huge concern, uh, especially throughout this pandemic, but especially during the, the holidays and uh, what we're seeing in terms of uh, lack of uh, social interaction. So um, it is on our minds. Um, I believe uh, we have, and we can get you some information on that. Uh, I don't know if Secretary Smith is able to provide any of that, but we, we'd be happy to do that. We should probably talk about that more uh, as uh, time moves on. Um, anything, anything, Secretary Smith, you can offer uh, right now. Um, if not, we can we can take it up again because I think it is important. Yes, Governor. The, de the Department of uh, Mental Health has been um, very active in this area, and we can get some information. And you're absolutely right. Maybe at a subsequent press, press conference, we can bring it up again. Dr. Levine, anything you want to? Okay, thank add? you. That's what I was going to say. One thing I would just know is there is an exemption for individuals who live alone to gather with one other family and yeah. that targets some of that social isolation for those individuals. And obvi okay, great. Uh, obviously all the measures we put into place um, we hope aren't long term. We want to get back to at least where we were before of this uh, uh, increase in number of uh, cases uh, came into place after after uh, Halloween. So um, hopefully we can get back to where we were um, pre-Halloween. Um, Dr. Levine. Just to add a couple of finer points, you know, you know, everything I did uh, as Commissioner of Health prior to the pandemic almost seemed to revolve around the concept of reducing social isolation, because social isolation leads to some of the feelings you're discussing in your question leads to what we see in the uh, world of adolescent substance misuse, things of that sort. Um, and necessarily, by being a pandemic, this does somewhat uh, interfere with all those initiatives. But I want to bring to everybody's attention the fact that during the pandemic, nothing has shut down when it comes to mental health counseling opportunities and availability, even if by telemedicine, which has worked extraordinarily well for that population. Nothing has shut down in terms of the activity of recovery centers with regard to substance misuse and the opportunities for people to obtain treatment for their substance use disorders. Um, and the Department of Mental Health uh, does have on its website a number of uh, links to just the kind of answers you were looking for, Chris, with your question about if you're having certain kinds of feelings that are brought about by this prolonged dealing with a pandemic, uh, where, where can you turn and what kind of uh, resources can you uh, access? So I would invite people to uh, link to those. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to add to Dr. Levine, on the website of the Department of Mental Health, there's a, um, there's a, Really, under the COVID, uh, the coronavirus section, there's a thing that says, um, a section that says, you're not alone. And it gives you all the various listings where you can reach out to get help. Yeah, and Chris, I, yeah, I want to thank you for bringing this up as well. And uh, we can individually act. Uh, we can call our family and friends and check on our neighbors, just give them a call. And uh, just, you know, just a, a few minutes of time uh, can make all the difference in the world. It's just someone you, they, they can have as a sounding board uh, and maybe just listening to them and just interacting. So um, anything we can do, again, uh, each of us individually uh, would be well received uh, by, by many. So and that's part of uh, what we're trying to do with uh, this campaign, so to speak, of, of uh, looking forward to the holiday season and brightening Vermont up and lighting it up in a lot of ways. Uh, so if we can bring some of the hope and cheer all along the way in that regard, uh, that would uh, that would help as well. Everything, you know, mental health is is uh, is as serious as physical health. Absolutely. Thank you very much.
All right, we'll now go back to Han Davis from Obermont Journal. Han Davis? Why, well, got... Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to, I've got a two-part question to Dr. Levine. I'd just like to preface the question so it was saying that the, uh, the, my questions here have really nothing to do with the, I think, the tr transparency of the, uh, the uh, performance by the whole by the governor's team has been outstanding. I think that the, uh, that the evidence of that is all around, um, both in the result, but especially in the Vermont numbers. My question is that there seems to me much less knowledge in the system about what goes on downstream from the uh, from the top team. And in that light, my question is this two-part question. There was a story recently about a shipment of, I think, uh, uh, anti-clonal anti uh, antibodies or whatever they are, a shipment of uh, bile to Vermont, okay? And the story was the story was accompanied by a statement that the uh, that uh, Governor Levine, uh, that uh, Commissioner Levine, did not think that this stuff could be used. My question is, what the hell does all of that mean? I mean, is, is somebody who is sending these this stuff, this uh, this uh, these uh, vials and these treatments uh, to Vermont? Were they did Vermont ask for them? If they come to Vermont, how do they? Where do they come? Do they come to the pavilion? I mean, do they come to Dr. Levine's office? And then once they get there, if in point, if in fact, Dr. Levine himself, okay, our own very own Dr. Fauci, thinks that this stuff should not be used, then what do we do with it? I mean, is it being sent out? Is somebody actually using that downstream? We've had some kind of crazy stuff downstream. The Manchester uh, High positives uh, that, that turned out to really mean nothing. Um, so, so what goes on out in the field medically, I think, is uncertain. And I'd just like Dr. Levine to address that if he's willing. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very willing to. Thank you. Um, and it'll clarify some things, too. So this is a monoclonal antibody that you were talking about, which has a name that no one can ever pronounce but it's something like Bamlanivimab. And um, the federal government um, determined that this is a potential um, major landmark drug that can prevent people with mild to moderate COVID illness who are not in the hospital from ever having to get to the hospital. And there is a uh, significant study from the New England Journal that does support that to some degree, though there have been a lot of criticisms raised uh, around it. My comments the other day uh, related to the fact that both the Infectious Disease Society of America and the National Institutes of Health had come out with a lukewarm uh, endorsement of this therapy. Um, basically saying that they didn't feel enough of the evidence was in yet. Uh, to make it a standard of care, if you will. And coupling that with the fact that it is a bit cumbersome because it requires an infusion center, requires several hours of infusion, and requires you to take an otherwise uh, a room that would be used for delivering chemotherapy or other medical uh, medications uh, into a COVID room. Uh, so it would reduce the opportunity to even administer it around the state. But having said all that, I was not uh, pushing back and saying this should never be used, and Dr. Levine's position is it doesn't work, don't use it. Far from that. I was just showing what uh, expert panels uh, are putting out in their own guidelines, uh, which was less than overall embracing of the therapy. Um, having said that, though, the government, the federal government, is sending an apportionment out to each state and trying to set up a future schedule with the states. We chose to have ours go to uh, the UVM Medical Center, 
which uh, will probably be one of the few places around the state that would be able to dedicate a room for the administration of this. We continue to have active discussions with the academic medicine community, both general medicine and especially infectious disease and critical care medicine, who would be uh, charged with delivering this medication to the patient and helping us as Vermont uh, take what we know on a national basis and adopt it to Vermont in terms of guidelines. And I have to say that uh, our discussions have changed because of what these national bodies have come out with. So originally, you know, open arms, ready to receive and administer, uh, and we'll get over all of the logistic hurdles we need to deliver this. That's evolved into a little bit more circumspect uh, approach. And there'll be meetings next week again to uh, again help us pin down what our Vermont approach should be. Um, based again on using the evidence that's out there and coming to informed decision making. So I don't want people to think I've uh, sort of said, send it back, we never wanted it in the first place. Far from that, but we do need to engage in this ongoing, uh, real important discussion about uh, how we should respond as Vermonters and as a Vermont clinical community uh, in trying to provide the best for our citizens. So uh, I'll ask you to stay tuned because I'll have more to say probably within a week. Uh, but we've not sent anything back by any means. Uh, we still have a number of doses here in the state uh, and we're not giving them up. And we've actually just talked with the federal government uh, the day before Thanksgiving again on all of those issues, which they were well aware of because they didn't anticipate all of them would come up either. Uh, and these uh, societies and expert panel guidelines have only recently uh, made this made the scene, if you will. Did you say you had two thank, questions? Thank you very much. In that, most, almost all, I appreciate that very much. But the question I have is really is that the, uh, the Vermont delivery system, medical delivery system, is not a monolith. And you know, working it out with uh, the players at UVM or the players at Dartmouth, and it, it strikes me as a, not that matters, but it strikes me as the absolute right thing to do. But what I'm curious about is what happens if you get a request from three other hospitals, smaller hospitals in Vermont, that say, hey, we want to have this send it to us now. And the question is, how, to me, is how, how strong is the, how strong are the controls, the medical controls? on the way the treatment for something as, as tough as this virus flow out through the system. That's what I'm really looking for. But I think you, I, I think I'm not, I don't think you can answer that now, but I appreciate your answer. I think it's a huge question. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and across all of our hospitals, uh, these things get connected as well. And clearly if somebody wanted to administer this, they'd have to have the facility to do it with, or they'd be sending the person uh, to Burlington. So we have to iron out how that would work as well. But the same discussions are occurring, you know, with the federal government with vaccine and making sure that the uh, distribution system to the state is one that works for us, not only in terms of being able to get it quickly to every corner of the state, but also making sure that the storage requirements for the various vaccine are available everywhere we need it to be. So it takes a huge coordinated effort a lot of things going on behind the scenes that you or anyone in the public wouldn't actually even recognize at this point because it's all in preparation for when we start seeing vaccine, hopefully towards the middle or latter part of the month of December. Thank you, sir. All right, Keith, the Rutland Barrel. Hi, there is a, uh, I believe a draft report out on the Vermont State College system that seems to suggest further consolidation, namely between Castleton and uh, Northern Vermont University, um, plus obviously giving it more um, state aid. I'm just curious if, um, and I realize that is a pretty early report, but I'm wondering if there's any thoughts on what that looks like now. Um, I know 
in the past there's been a lot of talk about that system having a change, but that seems pretty drastic also. I, I don't know if anybody that about it or, or what? Yeah, Keith, I have not seen that report as yet, but uh, but I expect we'll we'll probably see it the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, really, don't have much to say about it other than we know um, pre-pandemic uh, that the state college system had its challenges, and uh, and this has uh, highlighted the fact that there's got to be have to, there's got to be some systems changes. Uh, in order for uh, the system to survive. So look forward to whatever uh, they have to offer, and I'm sure the legislature will want to weigh in as well. Thank you. Colin, seven days. Hi, thanks. I'm, I'm curious as to, um, probably for Dr. Levine or maybe Secretary Smith, um, given the recent outbreak at the um, nursing home facility. Could you tell us if there's any lessons we have learned from the spring when we had um, some similar situations at Birchwood and Burlington Health and Rehab? Have we learned anything that helps us better um, respond to these situations? Since I'm the one in the room, I guess I could start. Is that okay with you, Secretary Smith? Go right ahead. Abundant lessons, abundant lessons. Um, which we've actually had in implementation and practice for six months now. Um, one of the key lessons uh, is that the moment we know of anyone positive, whether it be a staff member or a resident of the facility, we immediately test the entire facility and get a good handle on what the state is on the ground right then and there. That enables us not only to uh, begin to understand who's got what, but it enables us to do the appropriate infection control uh, throughout the facility, making sure that patients who have test positive or staff who test positive are appropriately isolated, and we use the term cohorted so that um, staff that are taking care of positive patients are only taking care of positive patients and vice versa. Those who are taking care of negative are only taking care of negative. We also make sure that in places that have people on different floors or on the same floor but in different units or wings on those floors, that we try to make sure that uh, there's strict isolation between all of those settings so that if an outbreak occurred in only one floor or one wing, it can be limited to that area alone. Additionally, uh, besides the initial facility-wide testing, we, uh, with the CDC, pioneered an entire protocol of testing every several days over a 14-day period so that we don't just accept the first test as what's going on, but we have an ongoing surveillance and can try to act again decisively and quickly if we find another positive along the way whether it's on day three, whether it's on day seven, what have you, uh, because we know that's how these things tend to evolve. Um, the other lesson we learned is um, that sometimes the risk to the facility is not the staff, but it's the admission of a person who came either from a hospital or even from another uh, home setting, um, but was it not symptomatic, but actually harbored the virus. So we initiated quarantine protocols so that in addition to testing that new admission several times, we also had them in a quarantine situation so that if one of their tests did turn positive along the way, they would already have been isolated and not risked, put anybody else at risk within the facility. So those are very, very important take home messages that we've learned along the way and have really been pioneers we have a uh, healthcare uh, outbreak and prevention response team that the facilities around the state give kudos to, but have also received some national prominence for the good work that they've done. Uh, many, many ideas on their own, some in concert with the Centers for Disease Control. Secretary, do you have anything to add to that? You stole my thunder, uh, Dr. Levine, so that I have nothing more to add. Well, then maybe I'll give you one more chance, Secretary Smith. I was going to ask about um, 
staffing shortages as well. Um, I, I think we were aware of at least one facility that's asking for um, volunteers to, to come in and help their staffing situation. Could you just give us an overview of what you're hearing from these facilities as far as staffing goes and what the state might be doing to help them out? Yes, uh, it seems to me when we have an outbreak within this facility, um, the the initial the initial problem is within the, the first 24 or 48 hours because you're you're losing staff um, because sometimes staff is involved in this. So in order to stabilize it, um, we have through Dale uh, and Monica is the commissioner of Dale have met with various uh, long-term care facilities to try to help them out in terms of staffing for that initial period. It seems that if you can get through that initial period, there is some stabilization that happens, whether through travelers or other personnel that can be, uh, that can be gathered. But in that initial period, there seems to be a, a um, a staffing shortage and and we have been working with various facilities to overcome those uh, staffing surges um, and those staffing shortages one of the things that we've been doing is is helping through the SEOC um, the state emergency operations center as well as um, close communications with the University of Vermont Medical Center is trying to find uh, various nurses and as you know nurses are hard to come by uh, these days but trying to find nurses uh, throughout the state that can fill in for those short period of time we've been successful in doing that on numerous occasions but i i've got to admit it has been a challenge uh, as we have had these outbreaks in various facilities and do we have any facilities in that 24 48 period right now that are that are dealing with this yeah we do we have one and, that, and that's the one we mentioned uh earlier which is elderwood got it okay thank you and lastly is there have you heard anything about pp shortages that need these places as well no i i have not heard of any and in fact we have sufficient ppe to uh and we have been shipping PPE to these facilities in order to maintain adequate supply. Thank you very much. Courtney, Local 22. A lot of ski resorts in the region are opening this weekend. I'm wondering if the state has provided any specific guidance um, to those resorts? Yes, um, we work out an agreement with the ski areas and and uh, provided a path forward, very restrictive, I might add, <clears throat> and uh, cumbersome for them. So uh, I might ask Secretary Curley if she could add anything to that because they were instrumental in negotiating with the, uh, the ski areas. Absolutely happy to. Yes, um, the Vermont ski areas were great partners in coming up with a safe plan for operations for this winter. The guidance is actually posted on our website at accd.vermont.gov, and you'll find it under the restart section. But um, some of the, the highlights that are that are there are that the um, ski areas are going to provide a great deal of education to folks that are coming to the mountains. Um, making sure that, that people understand that we have a quarantine requirement for cross state travel, also as well as for Vermonters who may have left the state to come back. Um, they just, their, their occupancy on the chair list has, has been reduced. Um, there's a variety of different things, too many things to, to lay out all in, um, in this conversation, but I would just direct you to our website, and if you have any trouble finding it, feel free to, to email me. Okay, thank you. That's it for today. Um, thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you back on Tuesday.